I think everywhere I stand is going to be the same. Um, okay. Right, or a, or a high chest, right? So a body you could pair it, but a high chest was why they were creating. Um, it, was, it was very expensive, and I didn't really know much about the process of that until I, I worked there, and I've always been, it really captured, you know, that so often in every industry we pay attention to just what we need and not the depth of the work. I know you don't like to take pictures, but please take a lot of pictures. Yeah, let me take a picture of that. There you go. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out to the Delaware Contemporary tonight on this beautiful early fall day. Thank you for joining us as we celebrate Shawai Friends exhibition here. We're very excited that your work is here at the Delaware Contemporary, and I really appreciate you joining us tonight with a couple of panelists that I'll introduce in a second. Um, this is such a timely exhibition, and um, especially as we approach the elections, but also in this time of COVID, we're all thinking about a lot of things and your work and especially gets us to thinking about many things that I think are very timely for our, um, our community. And so I'm gonna let the panelists explain a little bit more. Shawi is gonna give us about a 20 minute introduction to his work, um, which I um, am looking forward to learning what happened before your work got here. And in fact, one of our panelists, Tracy, we are just speaking on the work in transit and what it happens when it comes from the studio to the museum. And so I look forward to that. This exhibition was curated by our former curator, Catherine Page. She retired in June. And so unfortunately, she's not able to join us today. She and her family moved to upstate New York, um, but Catherine behind me here has recorded an introduction so that you may um, hear from her about her thoughts on the show and her encounters with Mr. Friend. And so I'm going to go ahead and yes. let you put Catherine on for us. And then when he's done. Good evening. My name is Catherine Page and I am the curator of this exhibition. First off, I would like to thank Brittany Powell for orchestrating this program and conjunction with the exhibition. Um, Charlie Friend received his BFA from Massachusetts College of Art and Design. Subsequently, he received his MFA from Tyler School of Art at Temple University. He's received critical acclaim in the New York Times, in the New York Arts, the Boston Globe, uh, Atlantic uh, Magazine, and others, in addition to international in 2017, Shaolin Friend was awarded the Fulbright Nehru um, Academic and Professional Excellence Award to teach in India. Currently, he serves on the faculty at George Mason University. That's the place 
that NPR calls uh, when they want the experts to appear on the show. The Fulbright, I want to point out, is the most prestigious merit-based competition available. The International Exchange Program seeks individuals of acclaim and who represent uh, diversity in their society. It also promotes goodwill uh, through the exchange of students and professors in the fields of culture, uh, education, and science. So when I received a chalet's unsolicited packet in my mail, I was smitten with his work. Uh, on fact, uh, unsolicited packets of mail from artists always go in my mail file. Uh, my MO, you call us, we'll call you. But I was so impressed with Shaoway's Maite, his story, and the utter relevance uh, of his work that I offered him a solo show. He's taught me so much about life through his work that I could not be more honored to say, please join me in welcoming Shaoway Friend to the Delaware Contemporary. Good evening. First, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to be with me tonight. Second, I want to say a heartfelt gratitude to Catherine Page, the curator who, with her vision and passion, made this exhibit a reality. What a joy to know and have the privilege of work with Catherine. I want to say thank you to Leslie Schaefer the executive director who masterfully juggled the many exhibition commitments affected by Corona. Thank you, Leslie, for sharing my work with your community. I want to say thank you to Brittany Powell, the director of public engagement who arranged this evening and other events. I want to say thank you to Rick Hidalgo, the exhibition director, for the amazing job hanging my show. My thankfulness extends to the entire team of the Delaware Contemporary. Tatiana Michels, Joshua Hollingworth, Tia Santana, Chase Doherty, Chad Hughes, Courtney Widows, Bob Mitchells, Laurel Howard, Chris Stevens, and the entire security team. I also want to thank Mel Hardy, chairman of the Millennium Art Salon and a dear friend. Mel, I am honored by your presence with me tonight. It is also an honor to share the stage with Tracy Monza Murphy, executive director of the Delaware Coalition Against Gun Violence. What a pleasure to share my evening with you. What I wanted to do in the 20 minutes that I have is to really give you a feel for where we the people came from. It really didn't come from thin air. It didn't come because I am a political expert, which I'm not. I've always said that we the people is not a political statement at all. Actually, I have written in the email that I sent to Catherine that despite the use of the Constitution as the ground of the paintings and the quotes from politicians, we the people does not encompass a simple political motive, but extend a humanist, civil, social, ethical, moral, and even spiritual agenda to address the, the undeniable impact of dark money on our political system and on our campaign finance. Where did this come from? Why do I feel that way? I mean, 
I am so grateful that I have an opportunity to introduce something that I feel so urgent. It's not just timely, because I honestly believe that timely is also timeless. And if it's not timely, it will not be timeless. And what I want you to take a second to read this, I chose specific quotes that really can get you a little bit of insight of how my brain and my heart work. I am someone who grew up in Lebanon and I have lived in the Lebanese civil war for five years before coming to the United States. The war lasted for another 10 years when I was in America. When I did my bachelor and my master's, I finished my master's and two years after finishing my master's, the war was still going on. And even though I was physically away from Lebanon until this moment, not only I carry Lebanon inside of me, but I promise you the impact of that experience was much, much greater than me and much greater than Lebanon. I have started with those two slides to tell you that even though these are not self-portraits, they are self-portraits. The greatest confrontation anybody can have is the confrontation with yourself. The confrontation with your own light and dark as you can see in the ultimate solitude, storms are raging in the back, abysses and, 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 and big summits are there. And he is left alone with a symbol between his feet of his birth and his death. And on the side, the eternal recurrence, how we always yearn for the light. When we are in the light, we discover the darkness that is inside of us. And when we have our darkness, blinding us, we fall, but we have to rise again, because if we don't, we're going to go into the abyss, which is at the bottom of the picture. I thought mortals love life. This is me when I had hair and mustache. I, was on, I wasn't always like this. I lost my hair. And I want to tell you that when you are looking at death, not only a death that is outside of you, but a death that is inside of you, Everything that we really connect with, everything that is dying and decaying and ugly and, 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 and the parts that you deny in you. In my experience, that gave me greater compassion and empathy when I see the death and the decay in someone else. Weakness is a source of life. Obviously, I'm making a Complete quote to Michelangelo, Sistine Chapel of Adam, receiving life from God. When I was born in Lebanon, I was born into a Catholic family. I was very, very Catholic to the bones that at the age of 13, I thought I was going to become a priest. I used to devour the Bible and read the Bible a lot. And one of the things that really remained with me after my spiritual crisis is the teaching that if you don't find God in you, you're not gonna find him. So double self-portrait, one in the role of Adam, one in the role of God, truly finding the weakest part inside of me and the life-giving force inside of me, not outside of me. When I was a student at Mass College of Art, I learned about artists that I never heard of when I was in Lebanon. And one of them is uh, Goya. And this painting really is, in my mind, when I went to Italy, has led to a huge series using the doll's head, broken doll's head. When I went to Italy, I thought I was gonna do landscape. I thought I'm gonna be like the French artist who won the Prix de Rome and went to Rome and wanted to do the Roman landscape. And I started by doing that. I didn't include these images here. But when I went to Rome, in one of my walks looking for architectural subject matter, I encountered this window. This painting is six feet by seven feet. So this guy, a self-portrait, is bigger than me. And all the broken dolls are metaphor for our broken humanity. Another painting that is inspired by the doll head, ever seen, never perceived. I look at myself, I'm not judging anybody, I'm judging myself, I'm trying to understand myself a little bit better. 
How many times sometimes we have the same lesson given to us again and again and again? Maybe I'm not as smart as I should be and I repeat very often what I am inclined to do by nature. And this is where the title comes from. In the middle, you have the many poor thrown on top of each other and the rich on top of them. Both the rich and the poor between Venus, a symbol of physical love, and Christ, a symbol of spiritual love. Below him, Adam and Eve, the new Christ and the, the new Adam and the old Adam, and Eve and Venus are in the same uh, uh, gesture. You have death behind bar and the question that I raise in this painting, how will overcoming death will be? Will it be by eliminating death or by transforming death? Also, when I was a student, I, have, I was very, very conscious in my art history classes of my feelings when I meet the new people that I didn't know. And Otto Dix is someone who lived in the war. He was in the trenches. He smelled the decaying body. And I, I feel the decay in this uh, print here. And that is maybe what I had in mind when I did a huge painting of the doll's head. And that painting is six feet by seven feet. The scale is very important. Why? Because when you are faced with these dolls, they have nothing that retain them in that pictorial space and they come forward toward the, uh, the viewer's face. Double self, a self portrait on the left, your silence calls me and your silence I suffer. I started to engage the human figure with the dolls and it really takes them from being innocent dolls that children work, uh, play with to becoming really a place of death and dying. Philip Evergood, I really wanted to include this painting because you can see very clearly the crown of thorn of the dead soldier and the crucifix behind him. And it is one of my biggest beliefs that divine suffering is nothing if it's not connected with human suffering. Civil war, a self-portrait, how the individual is given on the altar of the many. You know, I think you really can see in the title of this painting how humanist the political uh, uh, statements are. Our human rights were not their national interest. I am absolutely amazed how when there are no national interests, there are no human rights. Why? Because human rights have really become a, a cliche that we use to really bring violence and hatred into the world. Kathy Colwitz is another one. If anybody knows her work, I would give you a dollar if you find one happy piece. Why do I say that? Because people have accused me quite often that my work is very depressive. I tell them, my work is not depressing. My work is not even a flicker of flight compared to what's happening in the world. My work is not even a candle compared to the fire that is burning outside. I cannot be accused that it is depressing because it took me a lifetime from birth, all the experiences that I have lived. This doesn't come from intellectual, forgive my word, intellectual masturbation about issues that I know nothing about. It really comes from a deeply lived and felt experience that led to what we saw in the show. So, when I have paintings like this, in a way, consciously or subconsciously, I am paying homage to people who existed behind, be, before me with whom I had some kind of connection at a deeper level. Very often in the history of art, again, many of the pictures, I really wanted you to see that even though I'm working from this well that is inside of me, it's only after the fact when I'm putting this presentation together that I say, you know what? Too bad, you're not the first one who deals with these issues. So Death and the Maiden, I have expressed it in my painting like that. Salome, who is by excellence the femme fatale that we speak about in every possible way. And more, very often, I really like to contrast sensuality and mortality, the beauty and the decay, the youth, the exuberance of youth and the exuberance of sensuality with the awareness of death. 
I went to Spain in 1991 specifically to see that painting. I fell in love with it in my art history class as a sophomore at Mass College of Art. And I was so lucky that I am able to go to the Prado and see it in the flesh. I came back to the studio in Boston. I used to live in Boston at that time. For over a month, I couldn't do a sketch. I think that's what they call the, the, the dry spell of the artist. After a month, I was sitting here in my thought and a thought came to me and said, you just went to Spain to see the Garden of Earthly Delight. Why don't you do your own Garden of Earthly Delight? I said, no, people are gonna compare me to Bosch. Maybe when I am 60, which I am now, maybe I'll do it then. But the thought said, and this is very important, his painting was a reflection of his time. Can you make a painting that is a reflection of your time? And I did this. It's the largest painting I ever did. It's 15 feet wide. I kept the same format that he had, a triptych with heaven, earthly delights, and hell in the same painting. What you see immediately is that all panels are man-made. Our ideas of heaven are man-made. Our joys are man-made. Our ideas of evil are man-made. They are all fragile. They are either papier mache or um, uh, ceramics. And the last thing you see, they are all hollow. They are empty. And that was for me personally in my journey, my spiritual journey, the absolute low bottom in my loss of faith. Everybody knows this painting. I want you to know that when you are looking at my show, you're gonna see that woman with her baby in two of my paintings. Uh, I pay a lot of homage to people that I have some kind of connection with. And this painting, I also, when I was in Spain, um, in the Prado, I went and I saw it at the Arena Sofia and it was the only painting behind, behind bulletproof glass. And this is my painting. And this quote, in my first visit to the, um, uh, to the museum we have here in Washington of the Holocaust, many, many years ago, before even I came to George Mason, I came to George Mason 20 years ago in September of 2000. So it's my 20th anniversary at Mason. Um, before I came to Mason, I came with my brother. I had an exhibit here in, Boston, uh, in Washington and I went to the Holocaust Museum. At that time, they had quotes as big as this wall of the masters of the war. And that quote hit me right here. Because if you read the quote without seeing Hitler as the one who said it, you would say, oh my God, what, what, what compassionate statement is this? Why don't we talk about the annihilation of the Armenians? It's really, I mean, it's amazing how much the context of the statement can change the statement. Why don't we talk about the annihilation of the Armenians? And you know what? If you're reading the news today, of course, it is everywhere. Azerbaijan and Turkey are against, against the Armenian. Ah, all these years we learn nothing. So when you read Hitler saying that, then you say, okay, I can have a genocide of that magnitude and everybody will forget about it after 20 years. So this is my homage to the incredible hypocrisy of politicians. Look at these two paintings. Please look at them. Each one of them is four feet by eight feet. Somebody taught, a friend of mine called them American icons. You have no idea as a Lebanese American what I go through when I do paintings like this. Why? Because as I have encountered many times, people who know my heart very well, and they know what is the source of my creation, they accuse me. It's like, be careful. Somebody can call you that someone, you are someone who hates America. I exhibited this painting when I was teaching in Boston. I just put it up and I told my students, what do you think? Almost 50-50, there was a 100%, 180 degree, interpretation of the painting. Some people saw it against America, some people saw it for America. How? They said freedom is not free. 
they said that instead of the light that is a, 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 a uh, what do you call it? The, the, ah, the, the thing that uh, people on their horses wear. Um, anyway, it's a symbol of power. And you see the decay, the death around her and inside of her. The same symbols were used to say, okay, freedom is not free. We have to fight for our freedom. And the other people said, in the name of freedom, we're killing everybody else. And are we standing on what he stood for? I took that image of George Washington in front of the National Gallery of London. And these can be the Native Americans. One is steel and cold, and one is organic. And the contrast. And I, I have to say that the shape that I am working with, because when I had my crisis of faith at the age of 28, what happened is I started to look for the spiritual. I started to look for meaning. I started to look for the divine. Not out there, inside. In my interaction with myself, in my interaction with my own light and darkness, with my, that's why I started with that painting, The Ultimate Solitude, because I promise you, you will have an entire world inside of you that you will meet the echo of it in the world outside of you. At least this has been my experience. Of course, the Holocaust and the Holocaust are plays on the Holocaust. <laughs> And it's like, what did we learn, guys? Come on, come on. And when I do things like that, a very powerful quote from Desmond Tutu comes to my mind. And that quote is, the only lesson we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. And it kills me. It kills me. Just look at what we're going through again. Goya again. You know, us versus them, the people with power against the people. Yes, people who have the law and who have the power and who have the money and who have the press and who can say anything they want and they are accountable to nobody. They are shooting at us the people. And Picasso did the same thing. And I did the same thing. There was a period where we were talking a lot about the clash of civilizations. Oh, these retarded people in the Middle East. Oh, they are savages. Oh, they are not human. We have a clash of civilization with them. They don't appreciate our democracy. As George Bush said, they don't like our freedom. Like, really? 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 Yeah. Everybody around the world, I come from Lebanon. Before I even step a foot in America, I loved America. How can you say you hate America when you are offering to the people around the world human rights that they don't have in their own country? You have become a beacon, and then you say they hate you? Mm. Sacred and profane love? I like to engage the viewer in asking the question which is sacred and which is profane and why? Is the sacred the one that we embellish with all these nationalistic slogans? Or is the sacred one is the one that has nothing to hide? Requiem, when I was doing this painting, like many of my paintings, that mushroom cloud is really inspired by the shape of the canvas itself. Hope and judgment. So you really can see way, way before we the people came into being. My mind and my heart were trying. I promise you, I don't paint because I think I have something to say. I paint because I try to understand something that I cannot understand. And I very often refer to my painting as active meditation. I'm meditating when I'm thinking, when I'm painting. I'm thinking when I'm painting. I'm hearing voices. I'm not alone in that solitude of the studio when I am creating my work. And all what comes is something that is beyond me. And I'm not saying that in a romantic and sweet way. I'm not. I know I've been living with this guy. Sometimes I wish I can give him a break and leave, it, leave him in America when I go back and visit Lebanon. It's like, leave me alone. Stay home. I want to go on vacation. But this is every time I face that solitude, 
that solitude is inhibited by something much greater than me. Caution religion, don't panic, they call us terrorists. I will take a minute to talk about they call us terrorists to talk about labels. I swear to you, I am so blessed to be a painter and a teacher because every class for 20 years at George Mason and 20 years before I came to Mason, I talked about how when we look at the label, we stop to see the thing that is in front of us. And I show my students with their eyes how when they are labeling something, they are not seeing it. They are seeing what they have named it. What do I mean? If I have, let's say, even this semester, I tell them the white of the eye is not white and the black of the eye is not black. And they squeeze white from the tube and black from the tube and they make the white of the eye and the black of the eye. And tell them, look at my face. The highest highlight is on the bridge of my nose, on the forehead, on, on, on my cheek. That's not the lightest light, the white. You're making it white because you call it white. So instead of telling me what you think it is, tell me what you see. Perception is at the heart of my work. People tell me you're, you're a figurative painter. You're a, I don't care for labels. What I care for is I'm trying to convey something that is really killing me inside and I need to take it out. Not for you, for my sake. I'm sharing with you four paintings about artists who painted the slaughtered animals, Rembrandt and Bacon and Soutine and Jenny Saville. Amazing painting, truly powerful, powerful painting. And even before that, I did that. We have three paintings. Each painting is two feet by four feet. You know, I really love the titles are very important to my paintings. That's why they are inscribed in the wet paint. They are part of the painting. So when I did that, I remember I have a very, very dear friend of mine. He didn't see the painting. I described it over the phone. I said, you have the bloody hand of the butcher. Call it, uh, pushing the caracas toward the viewer and asking the viewer, is this kosher or halal? And he exploded in laughter because he understood. You call it kosher, I call it halal, we're gonna kill each other. It's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. And the title of that last one, that you may live, comes from Nietzsche, that some things have to die in order for some things to live. I make it. And global economy, the bull of fright. It's not about your rights, it's about the economy. Otto Dix again, I cannot wait to go back to Germany and see this painting. Katie Colwitz again, and a series of shoes that I found when I was in London. I was in Trafalgar Square, and I saw a massive, like 12 feet high pile of shoes. When I asked what it is, it was about a demonstration against landmine. And all the countries that oppose always landmine because they made people even many, many decades after the event is over, and the people who support it, and we are one of the people who don't want to make landmine illegal. So these are from that series. And most Nisa Propati, which is Mass for Peace. This is one of the largest paintings I ever, I've done, like, we, uh, like uh, the Garden of Earthly Delights. It's four feet by eight feet when it's closed. And when you open it, you see this inside, all the symbolism that I have worked with, the dolls, the shoes, the skulls, and incredible. When you are confronted with this, it is like you are in a cathedral looking at a religious work. And babies, babies, how can you forget children in everything that we do? And my series of children, invisible children, nothing is personal, just economic interest. And this is the last of the painting before we get. Citizens United, that's the only, the first painting that I did before I even got to paint on the Constitution. And the three big influences that I've been always having a conversation with are Goya's Disasters of War, Otto Dix War, and Henry Moore War. If you don't know them, they are series of print. And Goya, as you can see in the bottom of it, has that dialogue that is happening between the word and the image, and maybe consciously or subconsciously, 
it inspired that idea of putting the world and the image together. And please take a second or 10 seconds to read this. All of them are from Matthew. Why did I put them? Hopefully, hopefully, one day I'm gonna have a book of We the People. And I have this on the cover of the book, why? Because of the incredible hypocrisy of religious political dogma. I am absolutely appalled, appalled how Christians use their political agenda to really oppress people and to really have incredibly ugly division that no one needs, which is the opposite of the message of Christ. And each one of these quotes will condemn them. Other quotes, I love the one by James Baldwin in the, James Baldwin in the middle. And this is really what I have at the beginning of my book. It's a very important quote to me because when people accuse me that you are, you know, another immigrant who hates America, I absolutely love America. I thank America for the opportunity that it gave me to be here with you tonight and to share my work with you. And the first one is also very, very powerful because it is very, very true. So when I started We the People, which is why we're here, I really started because I was cussing in my studio when I learned what Citizens United is. When I learned that money is free speech and corporations are people, I was like appalled. Why are you making corruption legal? Nobody is breaking the law. Everybody is within the confinement of the law, but we can have, as we can see now, a, 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 a a race that is costing almost a billion dollars. And every year is more than the other year. And Citizens United is the reason why. I want to tell you very briefly about the, how it was born. It was born because of my awareness of Citizens United. I thought, OK, I'll take that anger and that rage and I'll put it in a few paintings. I worked on that series for 10 years. I worked on that series not knowing where it's going to lead me. It is the series. I, I have to tell you that moment when I was at the National Archives and I saw these sacred national documents, I swear to you I'm not being sentimental about it. When I went down to the bookstore and I saw that they have parchment paper of the Constitution and the other document, the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence, the only reason why I picked the, the Constitution is because it starts with we the people. I didn't even have to read about it. I just want to focus on us, the people. And what happened during 10 years of work, it started to morph. You know, why? Why when we blah, 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 we're here to serve the people and we do everything that corporations tell us to do. I've been reading articles that blows my mind. It sounds like Lebanon, where the corporations are telling the congressmen and the, the representative what to say. And some of the things that I have read is that it's almost word for word of what somebody gave them to say publicly. And they say they, they are serving their constituents. Impunity of power. Endless wars. Your sons and daughters died for freedom, not for corporate greed. And what I want to tell you is that when I started, I honestly had no clue, none of where it's gonna lead me. So I went from the influence of money on politics and policy to talking about Native American rights, African American rights, women's rights, immigrants' rights, prisoners' rights and mass incarceration, veterans' rights, LGBTQ rights, environment's rights, and endless war, follow the money. America is a business, not a democracy. That a line a very, a very dear friend made me aware of, and it was one of the movies, which I don't know what the movie is because I didn't see it, but I thought, oh my God, this is so fitting that where there is money, we put human rights and we have democracy as the reason why we are engaged in endless wars. Read those two seconds, please. I really would like to finish with that.
And have you met the other within yourself? Dare to be a bridge, not a wall. Catherine mentioned that a Fulbright, I am a Fulbright scholar. I got my Fulbright because I wrote five pages where I'm saying I want my wall, my art to be a bridge, not a wall, to tear down the walls and use the same stones to build bridges. I don't know this guy, he's black. What do I have to do with him? You're a woman, what do I know about women? You're Native American, you're gay, you're lesbian, you're... What do I, I don't have to be the other because I have encountered the other in me. And I promise you it's not a cheap statement. Everything I hate about the other I found in me and that created empathy and compassion. And that is why I create my work. I genuinely hope from all my heart that I have had something that can be really of some use to you in your journey. Because you know what? All of us are on this journey together. All of us, in Lebanon, in China, in India, we're all in this together. And I pray that you leave this lecture with the question of, what can I do to be a light in this darkened world where I am? Thank you. I don't know how long I took. How long I took. Wow. That's too much. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I took much. Like 25, wait, 20 minutes longer than I was supposed to. Forgive me. Forgive me. I'm guilty. All right. That was our pleasure. Thank you very much. And, um, I would like to contextualize his work even further by bringing up Mel Hardy. And Mel um, and I just met tonight, and I think you and, and uh, Mr. Friend have been friends for a bit, but you encountered each other through the work that you do by making people aware of artists having in-depth conversations in many different, on many different levels about what their work can mean and how it can be displayed, translated, communicated. And um, so he has uh, an organization in DC that invites um, the public in general to um, salon style conversations about the work of contemporary artists, something that I think we all need to spend time and just really sit back and have those conversations with an artist in front of the work. So thank you for that work you're doing. I can't wait to hear what you have to say about his work. So if you don't mind coming on up and Tracy. Tracy is the um, executive director of the Delaware Coalition Against um, Gun Violence. We're really very uh, privileged to have you here and to hear your um, interests as they relate to the interests of um, our artists that's on display. So Tracy, if you don't mind joining me up here. And if you don't mind having another seat, um, I think I'd like to give the panelists an opportunity to give their responses to the show and maybe um, some comments on your work. And then I could open it up to questions if anyone has questions for the artist or either of the panelists, that would be um, fantastic. So uh, Mel Hardy, would you mind getting us started on some thoughts? Well, thank on you very show? much, uh, Leslie, and I'm delighted to be on this panel to join you, Tracy, Leslie, and Shawi. I'm here at the behest of uh, Shawi, and thank you for inviting me here. I'm a big fan of, uh, of uh, Shawi's artistry, as you will see from the exhibition, that there is a level of um, um, uh, artistic and aesthetic uh, integrity in his work there is um, a high degree of craft and skill uh, in the artistry. Uh, the presentation of the work is, um, is, is really quite, quite fine, uh, but it's both ideation and composition that is the mark of, of this, uh, what I consider to be a monumental artist. I'm really here, uh, again, at the behest of my wife who's sitting there as Juanita, who, um, uh, she is the, um, the originator of the idea of Millennium Art Salon, which uh, exists to connect uh, artists and collectors. That's, that's the way we got our start some 20, almost 21 years ago now. And so 
we uh, invite luminaries to hold forth for an audience that we invite uh, for the sole purpose of advancing the arts, culture, and humanities across the discipline of the arts. But uh, while we might have gotten our start uh, focused on the African-American community and Afro-Americana in the uh, fine arts, uh, we have embraced across the ethnocultural spectrum of art production uh, and the artists themselves. So we consider ourselves, much like Shawi, to be humanists, to be uh, predicated on uh, delivering uh, what we consider to be the fine art of conversation and advancing cultural literacy through the arts, artistic programming, uh, for the benefit of, of uh, those whom we are, are favored to touch. We we're here tonight to talk about Shawi's work. <clears throat> and the backdrop is uh, We the People, which is that first uh, 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 line in our US Constitution. And we know that the US Constitution was really built upon this um, predisposition to founding uh, a nation in which uh, a group of men uh, would think about how to knit together a nation state um, uh, that, you know, had lots of tensions associated with its development. The Madisonian approach, uh, the Hamiltonian approach, the Jeffersonian approach, the, all of these tensions were, were riven. The anti-federalist, there, there's so much that went into uh, the debate, the internal debate, in trying to get to uh, this initial document. So it starts with um, uh, the Bill of Rights and that uh, uh, first uh, amendment uh, to what is the Constitution, which uh, let me read it to you. The First Amendment prohibits the making of any law res uh, respecting the establishment of religion. I'll go on to that, but um, it, it's, it's the right to assemble um, and the freedom of speech. So shall we talk about Citizens United uh, and the corporate influence, we talk about dark money or whatever, but the, the matter of the freedom of speech is really important because we are living today with a, a document that uh, talks initially about that freedom of speech. And today we see uh, in our year of 2020, that there are uh, prohibitions against the freedom of speech. Um, the Constitution, Constitution is really fundamental to how our nation uh, works. We see today a big hot button issue about who is going to be on the Supreme Court. And I had submitted to uh, Brittany a document written by Jonathan Turley, a, a constitutional scholar, that looks at the, um, the tendency from looking only textually at the Constitution by our Supreme Court jurists to looking at the uh, Impressionism, uh, how they are impressed in their interpretation of the document, and how that weaves itself in to uh, how law is interpreted that law that governs us is interpreted, and how the um, how jurisprudence and how we are are, are governed uh, is is uh, delivered through these major arbiters of every aspect of American life today, and, and we are really challenged today because of, of what we for uh, you know foretell as as uh, the, the next body of interpreters of that law. I think we also have to look at um, uh, Shawi's uh, thoughtful understanding of history. We were treated tonight to, and I'll use his language, a lecture um, in describing how he came to build this body of work, the We the People body of work, 
And I wish you had brought that, uh, you know, it should also lend itself to the, the George Floyd one because that was one of the later ones that you did. Uh, because that is also so very current. The matter of looking at currency based on the foundation of our history, that constitutional work that was done by our founding uh, fathers, the founding documents, to get to where we are today. And what does it mean to get to where we are today? It looks at all of the stuff that has given rise to uh, knitting together these, these states into a union. We also know that there was this matter of, of the Missouri Compromise, uh, uh, where the uh, three-fifths of a person matter uh, mm -hmm. came up. We uh, look at the, uh, the, you know, what was the precursor to our nation's civil war and how Lincoln had to navigate this secession by some elements of those states against a vision of uniting and it's all based around the issue. So much of it's based around the issue of slavery. And so uh, we can talk about the First Amendment, which is about freedom of speech. And then we look at so much of the anchor of the tensions of this uh, American experiment, looking at the issue of slavery and founding documents and the issue of a racialized uh, Americana, which um, we, we're not gonna anchor on race, but so much of, of Shelby's work is gonna look at uh, uh, where Lincoln was. If we look at the Hennessy room uh, back here, we're gonna see those four paintings of the bulls. And two of those paintings have quotes by Abraham Lincoln. And Lincoln discusses his worry. And shall we thank you for presenting those because the bulls are the images of that Wall Street image. I worked on Wall Street for four years. So I looked at that bull a lot. <laughs> And to, 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 to know what that goal means to American, the American political economy, but to extract Lincoln with those goals, identify him with that, and his worry about corporate greed at that time, and the challenges that he foresaw with the influence of money then. And you are channeling that for us today. Amongst the biggest channels that we have today, we look at the work of Ms. Wilkerson and her work, CAST, a very important body of, of work herself, following on the warmth of other suns in which she traces the migration story. But today, the issue of CAST, as she points out, looks at the foundation of the American house and how over time that house has gotten old. Mm -hmm. Its pillars, its beams are sagging, the floors are creaking. That house is what we live in. That house may have been bought many years ago and has been handed down to succeeding generations of the American family. That house, if we shine that infrared light upon it, would show that there are so many things that need repair. And for those of us in this house to live in it well, we have to repair it. And I think Shawi's work helps us to understand, puts into context by looking at the backdrop of our founding documents and his examination of all of those elements for which our house is weary mm -hmm. and for which we need change. If we look at where we are, what we need, it is the primacy 
of human betterment, our agency in human betterment, our agency in human flourishing. And shall we thank you for presenting your work, your lens, your vision, your articulation, your vocabulary, artistic, so that we can better understand how we can match up to the Isabel Wilkinsons of the world. And in this house, the Delaware Contemporary, where the arts, culture, and humanities are really the crucible by which we can discuss these matters and have those of us creative people deploying our endowment as creative people to think about how we ourselves can find our agency in that human flourishing and human betterment. So thank you. And thank you, Delaware. Thank you. So lucky me, because I get to follow this, right? Can you feel for me a little bit here? Um, I, you know, I really related also to the Wall Street Bull, but, but I've been thinking a lot during this talk about the fearless girl on Wall Street who's there representing everyone else, right? When the bull is representing the, the corporate greed, the fearless girl is there saying, wait, 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 there's more to this story. And, and so I really look at my work, uh, in, if we're talking about it in perspective of statues, I, I look at the fearless girl and I think about all the children who have no voice when it comes to corporate greed and corporate spending and Citizens United and all of the money that drives our political landscape, which is something that we're all dealing with all the time. Um, how many, I'm curious, in here had a mailer in their mailbox this week from a candidate for political office? How many had more than one? How many had more than two? Text messages, phone calls, paid social media advertising. This is driven by corporate dollars poured into our political system. And a lot of that is trying to influence people to put people in office to benefit those corporate dollars, mm -hmm. right? And that's the organization which I work all day and all night and especially nights like last night when the tweets started coming in at 1 a.m. Um, against. And, and so at the Delaware Coalition Against Gun Violence, we work very hard to pass critical legislation to save lives in Delaware and to partner with our sister and brother organizations nationwide who are working to do the same in their own states and for all of us collectively to pass legislation, enforce legislation, and advocate for community programming to prevent gun violence in every city, in every community, in every municipality across the country. Um, here in Delaware, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take my moment in the spotlight here to share with you that um, we have a gun violence problem. How many are aware of how many shootings we have had in Wilmington recently, in Dover recently, a lot more than we've had in the last three years total. So in the year 2017, um, which was our highest year of gun violence in recent history, um, we've already surpassed that total this year in 2020. Um, and that's only half the story because half of all gun violence in Delaware every year is due to suicide. Nationwide, those statistics are a little bit different. Um, we roughly say about two thirds of gun violence nationwide is due to uh, gun suicide and one third is due to homicide. Um, but of course that's disproportionately impacting certain communities, right? Suicide by gun disproportionately impacts white males. Homicide by gun disproportionately impacts black males. Homicide by gun is the leading cause of death for black men and boys in America whose voices are not being heard in those corporate dollars, right? Because the NRA, which is the, the organization that I'm specifically referencing when I talk about the corporate dollars, is not in the business of saving lives. The NRA is in the business of lining corporate pockets with dollars. They are in the business of supporting the gun industry and the gun manufacturers 
and they have done the best job probably of any organization in American history in convincing people to do the work for them. Um, so, uh, so, so much of Shawi's work is so relevant in today's current political landscape and so relevant in the current interpretations of the, the sort of the, the embodying document, right? So Mel talked about we the people, but I talk about the second line, which is in order to form a more perfect union. And that union cannot be more perfectly formed with this kind of corporate influence that's, that we're seeing again and again and again. Um, Mel talked about freedom of expression and freedom of speech in the First Amendment, but so much of my work is focused on the Second Amendment. Is anyone familiar with the Second Amendment? You all know, right, that this is the one. We, we know all about the right to bear arms. We sometimes forget about the well-regulated militia. Mm. And that is just as an, a critically important part of the document as the first line. Um, and I argue that it's actually actually even more important. And what we see happening in our cities, in the bedrooms and the basements where suicides are happening is not a well-regulated militia. And, um, and that's where my work lies, right? My work lies in, in that work. And so my organization is focused on educating Delawareans um, about the risks of gun ownership and gun violence. And we are about supporting responsible gun ownership which looks like training, safe storage, and protecting the people who come in your homes. Um, I don't know if anyone here has young children in their lives, but I do. And my children don't go to anyone's house unless I have spoken to the adults in that home and asked them if they have unsecured firearms in the home. That includes the children my daughter babysits for and the children that my boys play with at their their house. And when new families come to our house, I offer the information to families that we have no unsecured firearms. The same way we are sensitive to peanut allergies and pet allergies mm -hmm. and all of the other things that we do to protect the children and family members in our lives. So um, if I leave you with nothing else, it's that responsible gun ownership is very different than what we see on the news and it's possible. And I encourage um, your questions to all of us about the intersection of the current political landscape, the current political trauma that a lot of us are facing in our country and, and the art that supports all of it and, and really lifts up our elevation and interpretation of the country. So thank you. Thank you to all of you for including me thank and you. to all of you for making this event a priority in your Friday. I appreciate that. So the program, I have time for a couple questions. Okay. Uh, does anybody have a question you would like to ask any of the panelists? Yes, Juanita? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I can't hear. Yeah, I'm, no. I'm, 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 Juanita, I'm having just a hard time hearing you. That's okay. We, I respect that. You can use the microphone. <laughs> Right? So I would have a difficult time having a 
conversation about how I became comfortable in this issue. Then when Sarah came out with me, what was Sarah came out with me? And I would like to shift to have some more conversation around how we can have more confidence in our system that we pay tax dollars for. Some of us pay. Not everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. It's Friday. I couldn't resist. Wait a week. <laughs> but I think if we had reliable systems, we would not have to feel the need to be in our homes. And I, I, I think that's the fundamental issue that we have. Right? That, that is a, that is a, beyond greed, because we know that beyond, there's a bigger, I don't know, I, I've done the time. You got my but, point. But you got, right. you got my point. We are, um, in 2020 America, which is maybe different than where we were in Y2K America or 1980 or 1960 America, is, um, that guns are everywhere, right? We have 400 million, 400 million guns in private ownership in America. It's out of control. It's out of control. And what we also have that's the underlying current is unfortunately, and this really to me is, a, is the harder fight, the harder battle, is a general sense of distrust of our neighbors. So when I was in graduate school, we, we read, um, oh, what was his name, Robert Putnam. Bowling Alone. Is anyone familiar with that text? He's a, a sociologist, I think, and he wrote, a, he wrote a book called Bowling Alone about the change from the front porch years to the backyards, the bowling leagues versus bowling alone. And he talked about the change in American community from relying on and depending upon our neighbors to becoming more reliant and dependent upon ourselves, right? The concept of it takes a village is different now than it was when our parents and their parents were raising us and their children. And I think that, that Juanita, your point really addresses the long-term change in of the American culture of reliance and dependability upon each other as neighbors. I am given so much hope by, um, and, and I'm speaking a little bit, you, you may not get some of these names because they're local political candidates, but there's a political candidate running for Senate District 1 here in Delaware. Her name is Sarah McBride. And she her campaign is talking about how Delaware is a state of neighbors. <laughs> and, and we see that in Delaware a lot. And, and we're a small state, both in geography and also um, in population. And that in oftentimes is to our advantage. I'm seeing some nods from my, my other Delawareans in the audience here. We really do tend to know people. And I think that um, the larger our population gets, the harder it is to do that. And I think that that, I don't have a solution except for to say I assimilate and I, and I relate very much to that. Um, but I also think we can't have a conversation in America about gun violence without talking about police brutality and about racial injustice. And that those situations are so deeply embedded within each other that there, there may be progress to be had, but there is no immediate solution. There is no, switch and I don't pretend nor should any of us that one political election will solve these problems but what it may do is change the direction in which we're headed and it may right the ship a little bit in terms of correcting some of the the, the ills the sins that we've had collectively previously that's the motivation to get out of the vote. You all, I didn't wear my vote t-shirt, but I should have. Instead, I wore my enough t-shirt, which is my reflection on, you know, this is what I did during COVID. I just shopped online and bought activism t-shirts to wear on my, <laughs> on my Zooms, and I donated to political campaigns. 
Um, but but I really appreciate that, and I and I think that that was probably maybe some of what you were suggesting is that we can't have peace in our communities when to your your beautiful work of, of George Washington's statue on the skulls of the indigenous population that 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 made our America begin. We can't have we our past, we cannot change our past, right? We cannot change our past. We can reflect upon it, we can know it better, we can learn from it all the time, and then we can change the direction of our future. And that's our opportunity. And that's where the political intersects with the ideological, right? Because unfortunately today, to make change today, we have to deal with the current landscape of too much money in our political system and too much violence in our communities. And we have to take that actual reality and work from there. We don't get to go back and work from the original document. We can only work from the one we have today and the interpretation thereof which is why I wore my RBG mask. <laughs> because, because at the intersection of, of art and politics is also fashion. And that's my art. <laughs> so I couldn't help. Thank you. I'm just checking to see, oh, thank you, if there's any online questions. Yes, sir. Uh, this is the Shelly. Uh, what's the evolution of your art uh, as it relates to the political environment what do you think of the current political environment? The current political environment? And how is it going to relate to your art in the future? Um, I honestly can tell you that I'm, I'm done with We The People, so it's over. <laughs> and now I my last paintings that I'm working on are dealing with gender, and they are dealing with race and gender. Uh, as I have said in my introduction, that my work is not political at all. I honestly believe that. I'm not, yes, the constitution and the quotes from presidents and senators. I think this humanism is a huge umbrella. Humanism is at the heart of everything that I do. I want to share with you since you asked a question. I, I, I started at Mason in 2000, in 2002, I had a woman who came to me and she told me uh, I tried to commit suicide because I am an only daughter and I am lesbian and my one and only mother cannot love me. And that was in 2003. And look at this, 17 years later, I still remember her. So to answer your question, I'm doing something about gender, identity, which are at the heart of our political fight now, because we're gonna appoint a justice that will oppose Roe versus Wade, that will oppose uh, Obamacare, and all the hypocrisy of the Christian right, saying that God is punishing America because of gay marriage and because of gay rights. It's like, really? Really? Is this the message of Christ for you? So I think this is where my heart is taking me next. Any other questions for the panelists? I wonder about your practice. About what? Your practice. Yes. Yeah. Your practice. Did you create the answers and then wrap them in the quotes from the different? Great question. Great question. Great question. Great question. Uh, the process is the most unpredictable process I've ever done in my entire life. You got an idea from my oil paintings that I have a vision of how my painting should look like. When I did the painting on the Constitution, I heard my head telling me, you don't paint on paper. I, don't, I only paint with oil. I don't paint on paper. 
And the boy said, do what you tell your students to do. Put the first mark and follow it. I did not know when I put the first mark that I'm gonna do 107 paintings. And to specifically answer your question, the relationship between the image and the quote is as fluid as the process itself. Why? Because the painting is not an illustration of the quote. Sometimes this boiling energy wants to create the painting and you have no idea how many times the quote changed to better fit the image. And never the painting said, okay, I'm gonna illustrate this quote, let me do a painting about that. So in a, in a very specific way, no, they are not illustration of the quotes. They are a result of all the things that we shape. I One more time for my panel and for, my, for the director, I genuinely apologize because I took more time than I, I was allowed to. We were riveted. I, 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 no, it was not. It, uh, when I learned that it was double the amount, I felt very bad. And I want to say publicly that, but, but I really want to give my audience the context that this really didn't come from nothing. And I swear, like when I was cussing against the Citizens United, I said, who is hearing you? Who's listening to you? You're getting your blood pressure up. Do something about it. And that's what came. So they're not illustration of something as well. I'm afraid, and it was a pleasure to hear you speak for twice as long, yeah, but <laughs> we are out of time. And so thank you, Tracy, yes, Murphy, My and pleasure. thank you, Mel Hardy, for especially for making the trip up here and Tracy for sharing all that you shared. We really appreciate it. I think all of us were really greatly educated tonight and we all learned a little um, that we didn't know before. I really uh, was enlightened by your talk and by your work. And so thank you. I want to thank the Delaware Humanities because they gave us the money to invite these um, scholars here to speak tonight and to have this program and to um, have you with us today. For those of you who would like to Send a little bit more time with Shawi Kren actually, and Mel. Um, they are attending a brunch tomorrow. So in honor of Shawi's exhibition, it's very small. I think there are a few tickets left. It's We're trying to keep it small for COVID um, social distancing because we want to have it in the galleries. And I'm hoping that you will share more about the work, the individual pieces tomorrow morning when we see you. It's from 10 to 12. And again, thank you. I think. Thank you. Thank you. I so much about your your perspective. I really, really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. I